Hello and welcome to Starship Sova's HQ. Today, we're going to go right back to the 1940s, 1950s and look at a collection of short stories put together in one book that possibly changed the world. I, Robot, Isaac Asimov. So yes, we're going to go back in history there and delve into that collection of stories, I, Robot. And like I say, it was lovely for me because it's one of those books where, and I don't often kind of reread books. I kind of struggle with that whole concept. But I've just, over the last couple of weeks there, had a little delve back into it and listened to it on audio while taking the dogs out. And do you know what I mean? It's, to me, for me personally, it kind of stands up quite well. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's a collection of stories that I think there was about, I think there's nine stories in there all together, do you know, and it's, it's a collection that, you know, on, if you first come to it, you know what I mean, and you're kind of, you know, a kind of serious reader, you know, kind of taking in all the kind of the big guns, you know, the literary figures, it's, you'll probably think, ah, oh, it's a little bit kind of, you know, weak and a little bit kind of stale and, you know, not very descriptive. And yeah, it's got all them, but you know, think about this first, you know, Asimov was kind of 20, and in his 20s when he kind of wrote these, you know what I mean? And I think the crucial thing is, this is, we are kind of seeing, this is that kind of Asimov, kind of getting it all out in his mind, putting in his stories, laying the kind of groundwork for the kind of the future stories, of, you know, kind of in his robot series. And it's, it's, you know, a fascinating kind of look back in history. That's the way I'm kind of, you know, viewing it. Look back in history and seeing how kind of Asimov kind of came up with these ideas and, you know, his workings out to kind of get his kind of, his kind of structure built so he kind of, he knows where he's going with kind of this series. And like I say, this series just kind of went on and on and on. But going back to this very first collection, yeah, there was other stories, you know, out there, but he put together these stories, and like I say, it kind of ranged from the kind of 1940, I think it was, right up to 1950, and it was in 1950 when this kind of little book came out, which was kind of the collection of these stories. And the neat thing about, and quite a lot of people kind of were doing this at the time, it was basically a fix-up, you know, he's made this novel, I, Robot, basically by using, you know, cobbling together these certain stories to kind of, you know, to show you the kind of progression of the, the kind of the robots in the kind of the humans view of them. And, you know, you call it a kind of a fix up. And like you say, he's kind of, he's put these stories together and then he's kind of wove a, a kind of thin little story around it. And it's basically the story of one of his protagonists, Dr. Susan Calvin. She's in the kind of the latter stages of her life, you know, she's kind of lived this kind of fantastic life. And she's sitting down and she doesn't give many kind of interviews and she's talking to a reporter, you know. And it's Dr. Calvin that's kind of going through, you know, basically telling you these stories of what's happened. And then you kind of, you slip into the story, you know. So you kind of, then all of a sudden you're into this kind of, this story. And it's, like I say, this came out in 1950. And, you know... It kind of, I think it kind of hit a nerve because, you know, you just on the pre-dawn of kind of the atomic age, you know, those kind of, in them times, there were a lot of worries kind of going off, you know, about this kind of atomic age, what's going to happen, you know, the kind of futures coming at work, kind of rushing at work. So, and it's just like, I guess now, do you know what I mean? The kind of, the futures rushing towards work. And people had their fears, you know, and this kind of book came out at that time, you know, and there's a lot of kind of, you know, in that in this world like at that time the worries about it and i think you know asimov kind of rode that wave you know what i mean and kind of capitalized on that and just you know from there just exploded on the kind of the science fiction scene and like you see you have a look at the body of work that asimov you know has done but it's lovely to kind of like you say go back in the in kind of almost in the time and read these stories you know and just see how he kind of put it together. The first, this book came out, I think it was by Noam Press, and I think it was the first 5,000, the first printing of 5,000 editions. And like you see, you can still get it to this day. Do you know what I mean? You can still get it. So that kind of says something. You can still buy the Blumen book now. You know, that's, that says, you know, the, the legacy and the longevity of Asimov's works. And yeah, 
it's not, you know what I mean? Come on, let's be honest. It's not the kind of in-depth, detailed work. You ain't going to find that there. I mean, like I say, the lad was 20 year old, you know what I mean? So, yeah, you know, he hasn't even kind of started on his life. But it's all there. Do you know what I mean? It's all there. That's the kind of exciting thing. And it's like, when you read his stories, it's like looking at, you know, a kind of fine history, you know, a little bit of like an antique. Reading these stories, you know what I mean? Kind of just delving into that world of that time, you know, the kind of 50s. Well, actually, like I say, the stories were wrote in the 1940s. So it's kind of going into that little world and just kind of submersing yourself in there and just absorbing it. And, and you, you understand the kind of, you know, Asimov was putting these kind of stories and these themes of like the fears of like the atomic age and, you know, life and death and it's all there. And like I say, it, yeah, it's not, you know, clever writing. There's a lot of kind of show and tell, you know what I mean? He's, he's kind of just straightforward, but it's a lovely little kind of concept, just a little book just to kind of delve into. I mean, later would come, you know, Caves of Steel and The Naked Sun. Do you know what I mean? You can tell what, as you, you know, he's getting himself more, you know, he's, he's, he's learning all the time. Like you say, great books, them. And I like the kind of concept of robo-psychologist. Do you know what I mean? This Dr. Suvan Calvin. And that's a great little kind of concept. You know what I mean? Just to kind of, you know, the, to work out the kind of, them issues robots have and what people have all over robots. You know what I mean? And like I say, it's all in this little book. Do you know what I mean? The story is picked to go into this kind of collection to kind of, and have this kind of narrative weave its way through. It's, it's done brilliantly. It's funny, the collection shares the, the kind of the, the title, I, Robot, the, that story name. It shares it with another story by Iando Binder, who, which was a pseudonym, and I never knew this, a pseudonym of Earl and Otto Binder, but it's not connected in any way. Asimov wanted kind of his story or his collection, he wanted to actually be called Mind and Iron, and he totally objected when it kind of first came out, you know, kind of, the, the publisher decided to go with iRobot, he was just totally against that, do you know what I mean? This is the book as well, this is kind of where we get the kind of the seeds and the genesis, this is where it all happens, that's the kind of crucial thing I like, you know, another one of those kind of touch papers in the kind of history of science fiction, this is where the three laws of robotics come from. A robot, number one, I'll explain. Number one, as you, you, I hope you know, to be quite honest, I hope it's, it's sunk into your skull. A robot may not injure a human being or, through inaction, allow a human being to come to harm. Number two, a robot must obey the orders given it by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. A robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first and the second law. And like I say, in his 20s, kind of got all that kind of groundwork sorted, and that groundwork there took him right through this kind of robot series. And that's the kind of, that's the, the concept I love. And like I say, there was nine stories in this collection, like woven through this kind of, this, this novel. The first one up, which is actually one of my favourites, is called Robbie. You know, it was 1939 when it first came out, this story, Robbie. It was first published in the September 1940 of Super Science Stories. And it actually went by the name of Strange Playfellows, which was given it by Frederick Paul, who was the editor of that magazine, give it that. And Asimov described that as distasteful. And it only got kind of revised into the kind of the I robot, where it got changed to, back to I Robbie to I, Robbie, to Robbie, when I, Robot came out. And it is, a, it's a kind of a sweet, gentle, you know, little story. Like I say, 20 year old when he wrote this. And it's just this kind of a little girl's kind of robot who doesn't kind of speak, but just has so much kind of love for her. And it's the kind of, the, the mother especially worries about, you know, this kind of, this robot, you know, with her little protective little daughter there, you know, she didn't want anything to go to harm and, the daughter just love, you know, and if that's the kind of a thing, you know, children just love anything, you know, creed, colour, you know what I mean, it's just the purest symbol of love, and it just so happens this one is a kind of metal robot. You know, parents today have got these kind of concerns and worries and fears, which are kind of, I guess, too, you know, for a child, just totally unfounded. In it as well, mind you, for me, there's some stories there that are just as as clunky as anything, do you know what I mean? It's like you see, there's some stories in there where I thought just were pure genius, and yet some of the stories 
I just, you, it's like a, it's like almost like a, a different writer was writing them. Do you know what I mean? And some of these characters, you know, Doctor Susan Calvin, that's a, a fully fledged character. But some of these characters that he's got working, you know, on these kind of robotics and you know, kind of technicians, just wouldn't get a job, you know, anywhere. It's just like, and yet they're they're in this kind of this environment, you know, this kind of technical environment, and they don't seem realistic at all, you know. Second story up is Runaround, and this is where we kind of meet the uh, the characters, Powell and Donovan, and like I say, it's just. It just, you you know, it it's not real. It just doesn't make sense, you know, to have these two characters that are kind of, you know, technicians at the first highest order, you know, in space, going everywhere. And they can't even tie their own shoelaces. You know what I mean? That's the kind of way it kind of comes over. And it just doesn't sit right, you know what I mean? It's just like such a gap between some of the good ones and some of the bad ones. And them, and them characters go right through, do you know what I mean? But in this collection, they're just... This is just, for me, shockingly bad, do you know? Out of all of them, you know, there's one called Evidence, and it's just trying to prove someone is not a robot. Do you know what I mean? That's the whole kind of concept of it, you know? And this person, this robot, possibly, you know, doesn't want to give anything away, and it's all to do with kind of political race, trying to get, you know, a seat on some board or some kind of government official. And that's just clever writing, you know, and it's just keeps you guessing all the time is this person you know a robot you know is it not and the ending's just you know not I'm certainly not going to go and spoil it for you if you haven't read evidence that is a great story you know go and check that out and it's from these kind of collections where the, the film kind of will smith you know they took different concepts of some of these stories and made i robot the film another great story in there was little lost robot you know a robot is told to go and lose itself by some technician. Another game, <laughs> technicians, do you know what I mean? They just like haven't got a clue in kind of. And maybe Ashimov, you know, at this time hasn't got a clue himself and he's just kind of, you know, he's just using his kind of writer's ability kind of just to make it happen, make them sound real. But they just haven't got, you know, they're not convincing. And one of these, you know, technicians tells this robot in no uncertain terms to go and lose itself. And that's. You know, from the film concept, that's the Sonny the Robot, you know, goes off and kind of loses his, or goes off and kind of hides, you know, and you're trying to find it in the film. And that's a, a, another great story. So I think the balance for me is 50-50 with the, the kind of the stories that are in there, what I liked and really liked, to the stories that I'm kind of, ooh. And it's, I think it's Asimov just, you know, on the first rungs of the ladder of being a writer, that's, you know, that's all it is, you know, it's, but I think as well, you know, we have kind of quotes, you know, that kind of Asimov never, you know, didn't want to change his style of writing. Science fiction writer James Gunn says this of I, Robot and Asimov. He says, liar and evidence, they are not stories in which characters play a significant part, significant part, virtually all plot develops in conversation with little, if any, action nor is there any great deal of local colour or description of any kind. The dialogue is at best functional and the style is at best transparent. The robot stories and, as a matter of fact, almost all of Asimov's fiction play themselves on a relatively bare stage. And, I mean, I liked evidence, do you know what I mean? I think it was the kind of, the trying to guess, but... You know, my favourite scene, he hits the nail on the head. You know, when you kind of read these, these are kind of, that's all, you know, he's not giving too much away, but he just wants to tell the story. Do you know what I mean? You don't have, he doesn't want to get, like, see what he says, you don't have to get too deep and, you know, clever about it. He just wants to tell a good story. And there is good stories in there, and it's a great little kind of jump back into history just to see the kind of, you know, you can imagine people's worries with this kind of, you know, just on the, the verge of the atomic age and what that could, you know, possibly lead to. It's, you know, I thoroughly recommend going back and checking out this piece of history, this kind of one little book, you know what I mean? Stories are just, some of them, you know, it's nice to see the clunky ones. That's, I think, the good thing about it. It's nice to see the clunky ones against the good ones, you know. Let us know what you think. You know, have you only read it once when you were kind of, you know, a teenager? Or have you come to it when you're a little bit older? 
or have you not read it at all and you're, you're interested in reading something like this you know again put some comments down there that would be fantastic and like i say every time do you know what I mean subscribe you know do that that would be fantastic you'll get all the shows you'll get notified about them and we can just have a good time talking science fiction do you know what I mean that's the kind of cool thing finding out different things in kind of science fiction history and having a good time as well so hopefully you will join me next time until then i would just like to say goodbye from me